And there is a hidden network, an unseen parallel reality of single people, mainly single men, some with addictions, some without, some with work, some without, who have spent years and years in repurposed hotels and B&Bs and lodging houses in a state of perpetual housing limbo. And there are ordinary people who don't present with any particular problem, and they're working full time, and they're doing everything right, whose world will be turned upside down after a single text when the landlord tells them that they've got to go. Homelessness is something not directly visible in Guernsey. Unlike most UK cities, those wandering through the high street or past notable locations, such as transport hubs and supermarkets, are unlikely to see people sleeping rough or sat with cups full of spare change day to day. But at the start of this podcast, you heard the voice of Guernsey Community Foundation Chief Executive Jim Roberts, who succinctly outlined the present situation in the island off the back of two years' research into the issue of homelessness. A new charity has now been launched called At Home in Guernsey, which seeks to tackle the issues by offering practical support to both those without a home and those at risk of losing a roof over their heads. With financial backing from Specsavers and a launch event at the company's HQ in February 2024, awareness is starting to be raised on the hidden problem of homelessness, which the latest data suggests affects hundreds, if not 1,000 people locally. Over the next moments, you'll hear from the people behind the research and the initiative, why they feel it's necessary, and stories of those who have faced living without a place to call their own home. To paint the picture and reveal innate stereotypes, Mr. Roberts invited that audience to think of the following scenarios and decide when they stopped applying to Guernsey. Why do this when there isn't really any homelessness on Guernsey? Um, It's a question that I've been asked more than once as we've been working on this. Um, You may have been asked it yourself, you may be asked it after today. So to develop that, uh, we'll play a little game, we'll do an experiment, and I'm going to make a series of statements, starting with the most extreme, and I want you, as as I say each statement, I want you to think whether you agree or not with that statement. So we'll see how long it takes before you think, actually, no, I disagree. So, in Guernsey... No one sleeps in shop doorways. No one lives in tents or bunkers or shipping containers. No one lives in their car. No one is trapped in short-term emergency accommodation. No one is forced to put themselves at risk by sleeping on someone's sofa. Nobody is stuck in an abusive relationship because they need the roof over their head. No vulnerable young person ever falls off the radar because they haven't got a fixed address. No prisoner has ever been released without somewhere to go. No one rents a room on a night-by-night basis for years on end. No one is terrified of becoming destitute because their landlord has given them notice to quit and they can't find anything they can afford. And no one with a job is worried about losing their accommodation. Now... Maybe you agreed with the first few of those statements, but I bet it wasn't long before you were thinking, well, no, hang on, there are people who are in emergency accommodation that can't move on. Or you may have thought some victims of domestic abuse are trapped. <clears throat> and as the statements went on, maybe you thought, well, I know that one isn't true because my friend's niece had to sofa surf or my cousin had to move into a and b when he split up with his partner and he was there for months. And maybe you heard one of those statements and thought, well, that happened to me. For the record, and I'm sure you're well ahead of me here, all those statements were false. In other words, in Guernsey, people do sleep in shop doorways and in bunkers and in their cars and in candy gardens and in the toilets by the bus terminus and in garages near Smith Street and so on. And there are people living in St Julian's and other emergency accommodation who have nowhere else to go. And sofa surfers do move from house to house to house, dependent on the patience and the charity of their friends who sometimes go on to abuse them. And care plans do get torn up because young people with no address disappear. So there is a problem, but what's the data, if any, underpinning it? And how do we know this? Especially when there is still no official definition, no statutory definition of homelessness over here. 
and therefore there's no official figures. But the foundation, when Alex Lemon produced a report in 2022, when we did that report, we did define homelessness and we gathered related information, such as social housing waiting lists over the years and St Julian's house occupancy rates and demand for Sarnia housing. And we looked at how many people call citizens advice to help with housing issues. And we spoke to lots and lots of charities who shared anecdotes about homeless men and homeless women in desperate situations. For the first time, commendably, the state's annual indicators of poverty report included details of people who were insecurely housed, that was their term. And you were insecurely housed if you lived in temporary accommodation, which was a list of named addresses, mainly B&Bs, or if in the space of a year you lived at more than two addresses. Now personally, the foundation would go further and we would see whether social security data could be used perhaps to count the number of adults in receipt of income support who have lived in more than two households over six or 12 months. We think that's a good way of, of capturing those elusive sofa surfer numbers. But it is a start. And even if we take the state's numbers as is and accept a degree of undercounting, then there are still over 1,000 men and women and children who are insecurely housed. And what's more, that number, which was accurate as of 2021, I think, that's a 47% well, increase since 2016, so nearly 50% increase since 2016. So yes, Guernsey does have a problem. Defining homelessness legally is a key improvement the Foundation wants to see to improve the data collected. Here's Mr Roberts again to explain why. The benefits of a definition is that across, across the states, but also across the third sector, everybody's counting the same thing, and you can avoid double counting. So it just, uh, and once you can put a, a number to things, it's easier theoretically to, to drive policy change. It's only the early days of the charity, but it's got big plans to help support those who are facing or at risk of facing homelessness. This is how it will work in the foundation's own words. And before I tell you exactly what At Home in Guernsey will do, I will tell you what it won't do and what it can't do. It won't solve the housing crisis. At the end of the day, fundamentally, the only way the island can do that is with an increase in the number of units of accommodation with a particular emphasis on social housing. In the meantime, At Home in Guernsey will focus on two things, short-term harm reduction and longer-term policy change. To bring about changes in government policy that reduce homelessness, we obviously need to work with the states, we being at home in Guernsey, um, and we also need to raise public awareness of the scale and the nature of the problem. The support workers will provide advice and advocacy. They'll make sure people know their housing options and their rights, such as they are. They'll help people apply for benefits and for social housing and guide them through often complex systems. They will initiate and coordinate multi-agency responses to individuals and family with acute needs. They'll help people with references when they're applying for a flat. They'll act as an intermediary when a tenant-landlord relationship starts to break down. And they'll refer people in need to charities that can assist with housing costs. In many ways, what they will, will do is handhold. When you are homeless or at risk of homelessness, the last thing often that you're able to do is try and navigate what is a complex world of charities and statutory services. It may seem obvious, but why do this in the first place? Now, morally, giving support to vulnerable people should be a no-brainer. It doesn't need any justification. But reducing homelessness also makes sense economically. If you are securely housed in accommodation that you can afford, that meets you and ne your needs and your family's needs, you're far less likely to fall ill, <coughs> become unemployed, and to become socially isolated. And if you have children, their life outcomes are vastly improved. All of this reduces demands on the state, reduces demands for benefits, reduces demands for statutory services. But, crucially, it makes for a healthier and happier community. The charity has been granted at least three years' worth of substantial funding from Specsavers, which is expanding its efforts to offer care to homeless people in the UK and Ireland. Now it wants to get involved in the local space. Here's Chief Executive John Perkins to explain why. The uncomfortable truth, as Jim's described, is that, like many places, Guernsey has a significant hidden homeless problem. The plight of people who are hiding in plain sight is something that, as a community, we have to see how we can support as, a, as an organisation as well. 
Now, many charities are, of course, already providing support in this area, and I know we'll all be hugely grateful in terms of that. But evidently, even more support is needed. And at Specsavers, we're delighted that the Community Foundation has shone a light on this issue. And of course, when they brought it to our attention, and when we became aware of their proposal for this new charity, we had absolutely no hesitation in helping. But it wasn't just Specsavers who helped get this new initiative off the ground. Maison Saint-Pierre, which used to provide a women's and children's shelter in the island, decided to bankroll an initial report for the foundation, which later expanded to include investigations from Homeless Network Scotland, helping to shed light on the issue in detail for the first time. His foundation chair and former bailiff Sir Richard Collis, explaining that research and the support of charitable organisations to date, and how charities may benefit going forward. Also present are several charities that the Foundation has worked with, sought advice from and relied upon as we have progressed our homelessness work. Such organisations have said they welcome the new charity, which will not only complement the work that they do, but will free them from helping clients struggling with homelessness and enable them to concentrate on what they do best within their charities. I'd like to single out Maison Saint-Pierre, who not only funded the homelessness report that we published two years ago, but they paid for Homeless Network Scotland to assist us in drawing up plans for a local charity. Without them, none of this would be possible. The Foundation is best known for its grant giving and for the help, advice and training it has given over the years to other charities. In addition to that work, and thanks to the generosity of our supporters, we are able to take an in-depth look at some of the issues affecting the least fortunate in our society with a view to improving their quality of life in the bailiwick. With our knowledge of the third sector, together with our appetite, ability and resources, we are uniquely placed to address complex social problems, including problems that are largely hidden, such as homelessness. For the last two and a half years, we've been studying homelessness in Guernsey its causes, its prevalence, and how best to tackle it. If we operated only as a think tank, we would carry out research, make some recommendations, and move on. If we were just a grant giver, we would wait for others to come to us for funding. And if we were solely a community organisation, we could not use our knowledge of the third sector to influence broader societal outcomes. It is by being a blend of all three, as we are, that we are able to have an impact. But what about the real stories? You can read a full breakdown of first-person case studies on our website which show the varied and tragic circumstances people have found themselves in. But Specsavers can draw on in-house experience to bolster its financial and administrative support to the charity. Employee Joni Nettleship, well known in Guernsey's third sector, is working on the project. She herself had lived for years without a home for herself and her children relying on family member support. She explained how this charity is important to break the stigma around homelessness and how it can be difficult for children to understand the situations they find themselves in. It's really a taboo subject in Guernsey, isn't it? Poverty. It's really a taboo subject, work in poverty. And homelessness is really inextricably linked to all three of those. And so when Jasmine said we weren't homeless, I thought, I'm definitely going to stand here now because I think it's just so important to have this charity to open up these conversations, to smash some of those stereotypes, to break down those barriers, to enable people to say, yes, I had nowhere to go. It isn't embarrassing. It shouldn't be shameful. We all need to work together to have these conversations and to get people with lived experience to stand up and talk. There are several reports on the Bailiwick Express site delving into the issues, which I encourage you to read. It's early days for the charity as it goes through the bed and butter motions of setting up and finding staff, but it will soon act as a distinct organisation with contacts and advice which will be published in due course. State support is not forthcoming at this time, though the government has been encouraged to assist in any way it can, and work is ongoing to define homelessness and give the charity a central place in any strategy. But to conclude... Here's Mr Roberts explaining the extremes of what could happen if demand and financial support is there in the years to come, mirroring service provision in Jersey. I mean, personally, in years to come, that would be great if, if, if this was the... Sorry. It would be great if, if in due course, 
uh, as has happened in Jersey with similar models, then that this charity does become a... I think a housing provider is, 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 is the very extreme, at the very least perhaps managing specialist accommodation. I'd also say that um, the Environment and Infrastructure Housing Plan does make explicit reference to the Guernsey Community Foundation as a, as a partner that it will work with to, to develop homelessness policies. Um, we see that responsibility passing to at home in Guernsey, and I'm sure E and I at home in Guernsey will work together really well. You've been listening to a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you like what you heard, please share, like and subscribe so we at Bailiwick can continue to pull apart the stories that affect you, the listener. Thank you for joining us.